Chapter 11, The Best in the Country, Same Day, Monday, January 7th, 1935. When my dad tells my mom, she seems to have no reaction. She goes in her room, puts on her regular clothes, and comes out with her purse and her gloves in her hand. Let's go, she says, her face blank, her eyes dead. Sit down, honey, my father says. We don't have to go right this minute. Let's just take a deep breath here. Now, my mom says, waiting like a child at the door. My father's shoulders are hunched. He gets his shoes, jacket, and hat and starts to open the door. No, my mother says, you can't go. You have to be at work at eight. I'll go by myself. You can't go by yourself. Yes, my mom shoves my dad hard. His arm bangs the wall. My mouth falls open. I've never seen her do anything like this. Moose, my father asks, his voice quiet. Will you go with your mother? On the boat, my mom seems better. Her eyes are angry now, not dead. Here we go again, I think. Before the Esther P. Marinoff, the Behrman School was it. And before that, the heat treatments. And before that, the aluminum formula and before that, the UCLA. At UCLA, they made us cut Natalie's hair, shaved it right off. They tested her like she was some kind of insect. They tested the movement of her eyes, the sensitivity of her ears, the color of her pee. They tested allergies, reflexes, muscle strength, her speech in a dark room, her reaction to Tchaikovsky, the way she ate, slept, burped, blew her nose, and even what she thought, especially what she thought. Nothing about her was private. At home, she'd spend hours in her room, rocking like a boat in a terrible storm. But it was UCLA, my mother would remind us. When she said the name, it had a golden glow. They had promised us a cure. If, a word my mother can't ever seem to hear. Natalie's problem fit the diagnosis they were studying. And so I spent months riding in the rumble seat of my Graham's car to and from Westwood and hours sitting in the waiting room until the day they let us know their findings. An interesting case, they said, but not what we're looking for. You should consider donating her brain to science when she dies. When she dies, my mother said, she's 10 years old. They shrugged their shoulders and handed my dad a bill. Things fell apart at my house after that. Ants in the sink, flies on the garbage, cereal for supper, no clean dishes. Natalie in the same dirty dress, the blood of picked scabs on her arm. It was months before my mother left the house again. And that was with my mom's sisters, my gram and grandpa her friends and cousins all around. I don't remember when my mom decided Natalie was going to stay 10, but I think it might have been then. Sitting in Mr. Purdy's office, I imagine punching him in the nose. My arm twitches just thinking about it. I'm afraid, Mr. Purdy explains when he comes in, she's more involved than we can handle right now. We're equipped for boys with the kind of challenges your daughter faces, but not girls. You might want to look into Deerham in Marin County. Mr. Purdy hands my mother a card with an address scribbled on it. Deerham, my mother's voice catches, isn't that an asylum? I don't think it's helpful to get caught up with words, Mrs. Flanagan. We're looking for a way to help your daughter. Let's not let words come between us. My mother takes her green feathered hat off as if she's staying. The kids who graduate from your school get jobs. They have lives. Some of them do get jobs, yes. That's what I want for Natalie. I understand that, Mrs. Flanagan, but it's not working out for her here. It's only been two days. Surely even a usual child would have had some adjustment to a new setting. Mr. Purdy grunts. Mr. Pur Mr. Purdy is the kind of man who can make a grunt seem polite. 
My husband and I, my mom continues, have done a lot of research on this and we believe this program, your program, is the best in the country. You are turning out kids who can function in the world. That's kind of you to say, but, and I don't think, my mother is unstoppable, that we will be able to replicate your success elsewhere. So I wonder if there isn't some way we could make this work. Mr. Purdy shakes his head. She can't stay here now, but if you wish, I can put you in touch with someone who might be able to help Natalie. Help her get ready, my mother offers. She sits up straighter in her chair. Yes, Mr. Purdy smiles his ladylike hands fingertip to fingertip. He tips them towards my mother like he's rolling a ball to her. Then he swivels in his squeaky chair to get a folder behind him. He copies a number down on a slip of paper and hands it to my mother. My mother looks at the page, then folds it closed. Mr. Purdy stands up to signal the end of our meeting. I stand up too. My mother does not. Mr. Purdy and I sit down again. I'm proud of my mother for this. Proud of her for getting all she can from this man, but I'm angry too. No matter what this little paper says, my mother will do it. Once, she sent away for voodoo dolls and carefully followed the instructions some witch doctor in the West Indies wrote about how to re relieve Natalie's condition. Another time, she took Natalie to a church where everybody stood up and waved their arms. She read the Bible to her for two hours every day while Natalie sat staring at her right hand as if there were a movie playing on her palm and she couldn't bear to pull herself away. And then there was a school where my mom taught music classes for free until they, until they let Natalie in. And when they did, Natalie just sat in the fancy classroom tearing bits of paper into tiny pieces. With Natalie, there is never a happy ending but my mom won't ever believe that. Forgive me, Mr. Purdy, I'd like to know what happened, my mom says, her brown eyes staring him down. I had hoped Mr. Flanagan would be here with you, Mr. Purdy looks at me. My husband is working the evening shift. Of course, Mr. Purdy nods. He looks around his cluttered office as if he's searching for a way out. Natalie is, I would say, unresponsive. He peeks at my mother to see if this will do. My mother doesn't blink. I'm afraid she, there was a bit of a skirmish over a box of buttons and some unfortunate behavior. Your daughter is 10, you said, Mrs. Flanagan? Mr. Purdy's watery eyes are suddenly sharply focused on my mom. Yes, my mother says, her white-gloved fingers closed into a tight fist around the handle of her green pocketbook. She gets up early. She likes to watch the sunrise, I say. Mr. Purdy looks at me, then back at my mom. As you can see, we are located in Presidio Heights. It's a fine residential neighborhood, but perhaps not an ideal spot for someone like your daughter. His voice trails off. My mother waits. And though our neighbors are largely encouraging of what we're trying to do here, we must be cautious about taking children who might strain the relationships we've worked so hard to build. Children who are, one might say, overly vocal. She screamed, my mother asks. Yes, she did. For the better part of an hour, I'm afraid. Your daughter's voice is quite shrill and coupled with her early rising habits. But you think this is something that, my mother holds up the folded slip of paper, Mrs. Kelly can help us with? Indeed I do, Mr. Purdy says, standing up again. He has his goodbye smile on and he's looking at his watch. And why is this different for boys, she asks. The boys' cottage is located in the old maid's quarters, which is farther from the neighbors. Mr. Purdy sits down again. He sketches a quick map for us. It looks like a bad pirate's map with X's marked for the treasure. Did you take her buttons away? I ask. My mom looks at me, then back at Mr. Purdy. 
We can't have a child who screams like a banshee at 5.15 in the morning in a neighborhood like this. Now, if you'd like to spend some time working with Mrs. Kelly, there's a good possibility she can help Natalie bring this problem under control. I can't promise you, of course, but if Mrs. Kelly feels that Natalie is ready for our program, we'll consider her application again in May. My mother is up now, offering her hand to Mr. Purdy to shake. Of course, my husband and I appreciate all the help you've given us. In the waiting room, Natalie's legs are open, the way my mother tells her, the way my mother always tells her not to sit. She is seated on a needlepoint brocade chair, and I see by the way her finger is moving that she is counting the stitches in the seat. We wait until she finishes the last stitch at the bottom before she starts again with the first stitch at the top. Our timing is perfect. We've had a lot of practice at this, my mother and I. I grab the old brown suitcase that says Natalie Flanagan on all six sides, and we hustle Natalie out the door. She is walking behind us now, a teenage girl acting as if she's eight.